Well, good evening. Welcome so much. Welcome. Thank you for coming. We're so happy. I'm Sarah Lipton. I'm the director of the Senior Center here. And uh, as a fellow member of the queer community, I'm thrilled to have this gathering this evening. And we're really looking forward to having our poets read. We have another one of these coming up on November 4th. So come back for more. And I am delighted to introduce who's the co-founder of the Rainbow Umbrella Group. Come on up. We have special COVID precautions for this evening. Welcome, everybody. Um, on behalf of Rainbow Umbrella of Central Vermont, I think I can speak for them. We're happy that you're able to join us, and we're happy to be um, partnering with the Senior Center for this event tonight. Um, as I'm sure you all know, Audre Lorde famously said, poetry is not a luxury. And um, that is certainly true. It's urgent, it's elevating, it's energizing, and it's fun. And I know you all know that, so let's get down to it. Uh, each poet is going to read for 10 minutes We'll have a 10-minute Q&A. Oh, and thank you to Matt Wilson for organizing the Zoom connection. And welcome to Ilberto from Orca Media. So each poet will read for 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a 10-minute Q&A. And afterwards, we'll have a book signing. There are some books available for sale at the table there. Um, so let's start with the first reader, if we could. Ava Zimmet is more or less a lifelong artist, coming of age in the theater world, adding a number of interdisciplinary years in the study of fine and performing arts. She has two books published, Lucy Dancer, an illustrated ch children's book, and The Lost Grip Poems, a Pushcart Prize nominee. Her poetry can also be found in various journals along with her illustrations. Her restorative justice work and all other aspects of her life benefit, benefit from the training and practice of Argentine tango. Born in New York City, she now lives in Vermont, US. Welcome, Ava. But it's convenient because um, uh, tango uh, is an improvised um, art, uh, and uh, life is is so uh, improvisational. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna read a few uh, poems um, and preface it with um, kind of an overarching theme of the poems that I that I chose, uh, which is that uh, we're, we're all on a path. We don't necessarily know what it means, um, but uh, it's informed by where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And I have a, uh, one of my kids um, used to get lost all the time. And uh, when they got old enough to uh, go out by themselves and uh, drive after that, um, they'd always ask directions, and I was like trying to orient I, this this uh, young adult. Like, and I landed on uh, this little exercise, which is um, to ask uh, themselves, "Where am I? And where am I going?" Anytime you get lost, "Where am I? Where am I going?" And then I can add to that, "Where have I been?" And I realized it was a super pithy like life <laughs> life view. Uh, because we, we're um, all on this path. So sometimes it goes sideways, uh, sometimes uh, we don't know how our uh, experiences are related, um, but then they are. So the, anyway, the first poem I'm gonna read um, is not from the book. Most of this stuff is new poetry, but um, I might read, if I have time, I'll read one from The Lost Grip. And all of our books are over there. <laughs> so this one's called Webbing. Rips 
tears and dewdrop refractions, excellent symmetry and imbalance, hanging from a thread stronger than steel, a home, a trap, a sight to see, a place to be. I write a lot of short form poetry, um, so I, I didn't want to hit you with uh, too many haiku. I have one haiku sequence that, um, uh, that I brought with me. Um, anyway, the next one is uh, also you know, a reflection on uh, finding yourself suddenly in a place you didn't expect. Um, this one's called Next Stops. Oh no. Not me composing poetry at a self-serve station overhearing truck drivers laughing over cargo, one on shift, the other done, going home, revs motor muffler, screaming, a festive touche. My pen suspended over the paper to write some bad trope, and now a record of tragedy, a witness of tragedy. What will the cargo's next stop be, and ours? It's an allusion to trafficking. I'll give you a little hint. Um, this one is called, Let's Go Home Now. Let's go home in the direction of the waxing moon and through the mist. I am the mist's lover. I enter it and it strokes my skin. Longer than a haiku. <laughs> this one's a little longer. And also this is one that might be on a Where Have I, Where Have I Been title. Um, but the title is That Rain. Who are you that rain reminds you of London? It reminds me of loneliness cured by some stretch of my imagination, then consumed leaving me desperately hungry and even thinner. That little extra squeeze you give my hand, you think it means something mutual, but it doesn't. And teared back up as if giant granite steps, rain. On the roof of the car, rain, as I slept and woke and waited for my mother to come back. I heard on the radio of um, uh, the, it, I guess they were talking about generational trauma that uh, uh, children born from mothers who were pregnant during Sandy Hook. Um, so we, uh, it, it, and they're, they're looping around to it. So uh, that, was, that was basically a poem about, about that. We've all had mothers. This one's called Lenticular Jew. Anybody need a refresher on what lenticular means? <laughs> Great word, though, isn't it? Lenticular, lenticular. It, it mean, you know the, uh, before digital billboards and stuff, they had billboards that, um, if you're on the highway and you're driving by and it, it shows one image um, as you're at one angle of the billboard, and then as you turn, it's like a different image. How did they do that before digital? It's because they're, they're on little like corrugation um, uh, surface. And that is um, called lenticular. So, lenticular Jew. Nearly breathing on its own, that soft and warm, yeasted bread with the glossy egg Glaze, the bread, the lies, me spared to live by 
a stone wall with little gaps of light and air, in effect, a giant tilt card billboard. Different image, different lens from where you are. And where am I? As lately as today, I'm what? A bit further open, inviting pollinators and other allies. A bit further on, slowly as lichen grows. Invisible holds in a rock face ascent. A stop motion time warp of disaster when the weapon has fired, but the pain has not hit. The bridge of death, tread but not crossed. The atmosphere between discovery of a lie and what lies beyond. Mama made that bread in a bunt pan and frosted it like cake. Code I didn't know was ciphered until it broke one day, signal signaling a birth of sorts. Tadara's Deli sold their broccoli rape and garlic dish, good salami and cheese, daily baguettes, and that bread. Only available on Fridays. I asked why. They said it's challah. As if I would understand the story whole and ought to have known. And eventually I did come to know my lineage of survivors tilting the card this way and that, seeing the bigger picture. <coughs> All right, this is some comic relief. Do I have time still? I mean, a minute or two, okay. Great, okay. Speed read this one because it's funny. Choking at the bra store in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. The matrons of Little Odessa, anybody know Little Odessa in New York City? Okay, right. Okay, the matrons of Little Odessa are having a good day, I think, and I make it that much better when I walk in all young and prenuptial. What do you want? Something cotton? What do you want it for? I'm getting married. She's getting married! Dressing room curtains hurl open, jiggly arms, breasts, jowls, and bums in black lace and straps. Their shamelessness shames me. She needs something sexy. They holler and hoot. I swear they place bets with sparkling eyes. What are they rooting for? The shopkeeper elbows me behind a curtain. This is a few years ago. <laughs> it's like where I've been, the poem, <laughs> and tosses bras at me with pretty things all over. I've got one on now, and she joins me, pinching a little here and there because it doesn't fit. I'm crying, but only a little, I think. Is this cotton? You're choking! Try this one on. I am choking. On chattel. Fealty on the deal I am about to make. My mother-in-law to be sitting right outside the dressing room, waiting. They are joking with an accent. Matron one, she needs something sexy. Matron two, it doesn't matter. Matron one, it always matters. She had the last word, all right. It rang in my head for years. Well, joking. That's how the Russians pronounce a joke. Chok. OK, this one uh, to end. Um, it's a sequence of haiku. And I've named them, uh, I've named this form of poetry eroticu. I knew it when she touched me, time and not time. I became a peony, blooming petals, smooth and wet with dew. Moon tide, 
draws the ocean in my body, even under this roof. That's it for me. Cool. Keep your questions. I'm joking. I'm joking. Thank you. Our next reader is Kim Ward, a poet, playwright, director, theater producer, and visual artist who founded the Vermont Playwright Circle shortly after receiving her MFA in performance poetry from Goddard College in 1998. Her, po her poetic play, Angel in the Fire, was a winner of the 1990 Vermont Theaters and Theater Artists Playwrights Showcase and was accepted into the last Frontier Festival in 1999. Other plays of hers have been produced by Moxie Productions and as part of the Burlington Fringe Festival, as well as through VPC's Ten Fest. She has had poems published in the Green Mountains Review, Metropolis, Circumference, Vermont Times for Poem City Montpelier, and in Birch Song, Poems from Vermont, Volumes 1 and 2. And her poetry has been included in Poetry Alive, Montpelier, Vermont, on several occasions. And she was happy to win the Jeff Hewitt Anything Goes Poetry Slam last April. So let's welcome Kim. stand back a little because I'm used to not using a microphone, but if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, I never have a plan when I'm going to read. I usually love to listen to what people before me read and it always kind of triggers, oh, maybe I'll read that poem. Um, so this is a quite an old poem of mine. It's called Instructions. Do what? Read again later, the label says. Turn instructions upside down, then read twice, bend, lift. Give one look, not two, and you will see a married woman just loosening her corset and letting her hip bones out so her man can enter her and claim her. Ignore instructions one through D if you would like instead to form your own opinion. Pull the ripcord to continue and remember, always keep your stilettos inside the raft as you descend from the plane and never land on astroturf and stilettos at all. <laughs> Avoid thinking at all times. Avoid all thoughts of thinking or turn instructions one quarter turn, jump to the left side of the raft, cartwheel twice in your yellow flower dress, letting all of the passengers see your underwear and tabulate how many of any of all genders looked. Multiply by three and sidestep the two-step Texas bar to enter bisexual heaven. <laughs> I wrote that many moons ago when I was coming out. Um, on another note, a very new poem I've written. It's called, Not the Wind Beneath Your Wings. I'm not the wind beneath your wings. I'm the grass ground up beneath your cleats. I'm the ball hit by your bat. The bug on your windshield going splat. You use and you use and you're used and you abuse. You never seem to know when to put on those walking shoes. But boy, when it is time to focus on me or your songs or your mother, your brother, it's me. I will not go there. I must be free. I guess we'll continue with the knot. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's called Job of the Hut on a Platform Shoe. It's not that I was suicidal, but I wasn't me. I was squeezed into this little box, the only box I was allowed to be in, like Job of the Hut on a Platform Shoe, oozing from the edges. And when I looked at you, all woman's curves and lip and smile, I oozed from that box until I was overflowing by the mile. <laughs> oh, let's see. This is what happens when you read on your tablet, right? 
this is called Glad Cling Wrap. And if everyone ever uses Glad Cling Wrap, imagine that the labels that are on the side of it, and I definitely wrote it during the height of the epidemic, of the AIDS epidemic. Glad Cling Wrap, or I'm happy to wrap you tightly in plastic just to have a night of safer sex loving. Touch, those spots we avoid. Stick close to this hot mingling, Spot the place to make my juices flow under that marble exterior I keep for show. I'm easy to handle, you know. It's crystal clear who's at the wheel when you take a roll of glad cling wrap out of the dresser drawer. It stretches top between us, that caution, caution on the side of the box. And when you finally tear at the box with impatient teeth, I know this spot holds the wrap in place for next use that cling forms between fingers and flesh to keep food fresh, and you are that. I store your Gaia's hips in a safe place as though it's not the touch stick spot I've dreamt of my whole life, not the raw skin to skin touch. This easy to handle crystal clear polyethylene body is rising to meet your too hot to handle finger sandwich whose Janice Joplin figure smile holds me enraptured even under the thick wrap of glad touch stick spot sex. <laughs> Yeah, her roommates did not know what to make of that. They were two boys, so they were like, what are you doing with cling wrap? <laughs> I promised myself I would look at the time, but just do this if I keep going too long. This poem I wrote after realizing that Gilgamesh has no women who are named. So the harlot is named, but her name means harlot. So she didn't have a name even. So. It's called Mistaking Myself for Invisible. It's been so long since anyone called me by name, even I have forgotten. I wake to a full moon careening overhead like a loosed cart on a steep hill and realize even my dead lovers did not see past my plump flesh to the deep crevice that holds my heart. In the walled city, the men flocked to me a river of hummingbirds exposing the delicate undersides of their throats, dipping into my nectar again and again to rejuvenate themselves. Now the wide world has taken them, dried their flesh and scattered their bones. The city stands empty, gates flung wide. There is only the blank stone wall and the sunset burning through it. My soft weeping mingles with the sibilant echo of a whispered name I may never remember. Oh, and this one. So when I did go to Goddard, I wrote this huge, you know, uh, they said you had to write six, 65 pages of poetry, which I had never done. And because I'm a playwright, I decided to write a play about three generations of women in my family um, surviving alcoholism and addiction in their partners. But amongst a lot of that was me trying to figure out how to talk to my mother about who I am. So this is called Mother, I Dared Not Ask You why I could not seem to love only men, to swish my square hips just so, to leave behind my favorite boots for a pair of your immaculate pumps. You would not listen if I told you I don't believe the skirt makes the woman. I'm not attracted to that great hairy lump of muscle across the room that winks and calls me sweetie when he orders a drink. I'm intrigued instead by the small boned man by the piano with the delicate fingers who plays the cello and smiles sublimely. I'm all a flutter when the waitress at table five with the shaved head and combat boots winks her pierced eye at me and says she's dying to taste my dull, unpainted lips after hours. I don't know, I don't, I know you don't believe in my search for the perfect hybrid, that you don't want to release me from the grip of your ideals. I find myself covered with each bit of praise you have ever given. Each nod or no has stuck to me like starfish splayed over the cheekbones until your portrait was complete and only my frightened eyes peered through, reflecting your identical face until now. Now I have gone out to pick the parts of my gender from the air, like bubbles they float just out of reach. As my gender climbs out of me in a twisting dance, each might burst like soap bubbles burst in the air, or 
solidify as glass cools into Victorian witch balls so that I know if I place them in the window, they will deflect the worst of the storm while still attracting the lightning I long to feel on my skin. Oh, let me look at, okay, last one. This is one of the poems I used um, during the Poetry Slam. It's called Eating at the End of the Empire. There's a lot of Star Wars uh, references in my poetry. <laughs> Geek much? They're telling me to give everything up. Fried foods, their aromas wafting like waltzers in the air. Chocolate, its loving lips licking my own for hours after eating. Carbs, those toasty creatures whose gluten is my bitch on most occasions. Even creamy dressings, which go on the salad they purport I should turn to like a new friend, a blind date, a sweet lover whose crisp arms should slap the soft palate of mine with a witty jaunt on the two-step dance floor. But I say no. If I am going to eat at the table of the conqueror, the emperor, the sunset golden piled table of the empress, I am going to do it right. Gobble like a Roman wife, savor it, pull it through my teeth, chomp, lick, laugh, and spit, and even use the vomitorium should the need arise. So I might live, damn it, if I'm going to live. Not waste away staring at the odd star fruit squash and quinoa piles and wondering what the hell to do with them all. Or worse, cook them only to peck at and then shove in the dark crisper drawer where they will make new play dates with mold. That hairy guy who keeps inviting himself over and over and over again so that like some court jester staring at the empress's toes as she shuffles through the throne room in her rumpled robe, I finally give up the ghost and just go out into the streets to dumpster dive for a pile of whatever slop and eat it until I need to puke it all up and start over again anyway. That's it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Kim. Our next poet is Linda Quinlan. She has been published in Sinister Wisdom, the New Orleans Literary Review, and Black Mountain Press, among other publications. Her book, Chelsea Creek, on sale, to your uh, left or right, won the Wicked, Wicked Women's Poetry Prize she was Poet of the Year in Wisconsin and has a poem coming out in Vermont Poets. I have to add, she's one of the organizers of this event tonight and a co-founder with an audience member and me of Rainbow Umbrella of Central Vermont. So welcome, Linda. Well, I have two things to warn people about. One is my allergies are driving me crazy, so if I sound a little, um, and go, I hope you understand. Um, and, you know, people have said my poetry is very dark, and it is, but I hope to have at least one poem at the end, which will be somewhat of a comic relief. So, um, here we go. This is a poem about my cousin, Danny who was the son of my favorite aunt. Um, and um, this is called Babysitting Danny. Danny and I met for the last time at a Fifth Street bar, two doors down from his mother's old haunt, where I ran numbers for her to the bookie joint across the street. My hand reaches for him, then retreats. He is a tear waiting to fall on my cheek. I taught him to steal at Woolworths. He emptied his small pockets and delivered his haul to older girls he wanted to please. Balloons, eyeliners, candy lips that bled into our mouths. His mother was 43 when she was found dead, empty pill bottles beside her, no last words, in an apartment above Cat's Bagels. I wanted to steal something for him, to give him his mother's laugh the way she held a martini and a cigarette. I paid for his beer and offered nothing more. He lagged behind me. My car door opened and shut. 
Six months later, six months later, he's dead, beer bottle on the floor, California sun on my face when I get the call. A gun in his hand, no suicide note, a long picture of his mother on the nightstand. So, and then I was going to read, since this is a LGBTQ event, this is a, a poem about my first erotic awakening. And it happens to take place on, um, my parents owned a camp in an evangelical campground, if you can imagine. And so um, this is a poem about that campground for Jesus. At my parents' lake house, Betsy and I pause by the bay. A crow has warned us, has warned the others we are here, early morning intruders, deniers of tasty morsels the sun has rotted. This piece of heaven where bikinis aren't allowed and drinking is forbidden. My father hides his rum bottles in the trunk of the car. I envy their easy belief, knowing who to hate and who to love. Still the landscape has magic, a superstitious touching of toes to sand, the ritual of my diving right in, her slow and careful walking. Blood sisters at 14, the touching of fingers, a timing of cycles. Among all the other teenagers on the beach, no one else mattered. We were heathens and never once got saved at the chapel. I became formless by the fire pit and delighted in burning marshmallows with pitchfork sticks we plunged into the flames. Sometimes I play devil's advocate, but not in this place, a place that captures the hateful church bells and the lingering sound of preachers. Preachers. <laughs> and um, let me see. Um, okay, and then I was going to read this poem called um, Father Tom. He was a priest at St. Rose in Chelsea. Forty-five years after Faze's death, Tommy finds me on Facebook, his sister perched behind familiar eyes, a distant cooey of someone long gone. He was 12 and I 14 when I taught him to French kiss. I had totally forgot what he remembered as divine. He asked for pictures of her, and I had many, teased brown hair, black nylons, a look of toughness we all flaunted in when she's standing beside Diane, a switchblade in her pocket. Us girls talk about the mental hospital, or how we scam to break her out, give her back her daughter, stolen from her arms, and move to New York City. Her daughter is 55 now, brought up in some suburb. I hope she is loved, has a fuck you swagger, and loves Italian food. Neither of us cries until weeks later in my car, the oldie station plays, Tommy, can you hear me? I was a pinball wizard at Revere Beach. Faze cheered me on and insisted we hang by the Himalaya, raising our voices towards the waves before the time when nothing would bring her joy. So. And um, this is called the New Orleans Farewell. Um, and uh, so. You left me an African mask, left me to enter the Please You Cafe on Lower St. Charles. Bacon grease settling on my skin, or short and round waitresses older than we leave work swiftly on a washed out Saturday night. Where tourists wander streets they shouldn't, Irado, Chapatulas, Cleo, past Charity Hospital where a half broken banana tree slaps at the heat of July making not a bit of difference to anyone, and I can't remember you there, 
no Mardi Gras beads around your neck, no music to sell, lying in a hallway gurney, stomach so bloated, and tears are often here, and the stifling air has no arms, and I carry your ashes to the Mississippi River, and I remember to be an outlaw, to ripple through people's lives with a soft, rebellious wave. And now, sort of comic relief, <laughs> sort of. Um, and this is called Almost Old. And um, the running joke with this is I wrote it when I was almost old, but now I'm old. But I'm still going to read it. It's almost old. I don't want to change the title now. <clears throat> almost Old. The hitch to being almost old is the idea of Florida. <laughs> strip malls and strippers, a restaurant or two by Walmart, or the villages where Mitt Romney spoke of better days. 25 years ago, I took a train to New Orleans and stayed for 14 years, living a dystopia life, a dystopian life, held up at gunpoint twice. The smell of jasmine stayed with me even after the police came three days later. Anne Rice in a coffin in Halloween for Halloween and vampires in the humid mist. I can't go anywhere anymore. 50 years ago, I moved to Aspen with four friends in a Jeep, the heated winter pool, lights and skiers, my first girl love. I left for San Francisco before AIDS, Touching the hands of long-haired strangers, I could have found Charlie Manson in Peace Park, among the girls I laughed with. Now Montpelier, Vermont, the smell of winter air and moaning mornings. I think of Florida. I take a nap, reliving times with old friends and saying final goodbyes, words I might have forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Our last poet is Sam Stockwell. She's published in Agni, Plowshares, and The New Yorker, among other publications. Her two books, Theater of Animals and Recital, won the National Poetry Series USA and Editor's Prize at Elixir, respectively. Recent poems are On the Seawall and Sugar House Review, are, I'm sorry, are in On the Seawall and Sugar House Review, and are forthcoming in Plume and others. Welcome, Sam. Thanks. I, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, I can. I can. Oh. There, that's good. I'm going to read a longish poem about the, in fact, longest poem I ever wrote in my life. Mostly about my work experiences in human services, so it has a lot of uh, human suffering, but such is the way. It's called Chase. What happens in late winter is a car goes off the road. An EMT with a shiny forehead arrives first. The car slid into a ditch filling with icy snow melt. And the driver, an older woman, is trapped. The driver's door held closed by the bank. And the car is filling with icy water. And the woman is saying, help me, and touches the blood on her face. He doesn't know how to break the window. A fire truck arrives with a hammer punch, and he says, watch out, and taps and taps until the window breaks. The woman is cold, and her leg is caught. She's baffled by the blood. Help me, she says, help me. He's holding her head out of the water, and he's saying, stay with me, stay with me. The water is cold. His hands ache terribly as the water rises, but she's just sleepy now. People say, stay with me because our stories are lonely. 
The EMT and I go on telling stories until someone promises to stay through the night, though we know they can't. When I was on the playground with a mute child coaxing, a staff person ran across the brown, lawn, brown lawns shouting, New York is bombed, the towers are falling. I thought, drama queen. But the radios were blurting through the barns and general store and the upper grades couldn't imagine a building taller than the three-story Coca-Cola plant. The total dead in New York would mean this village and the next two hamlets would be empty. The story of mismatched socks, strewn lunch bags, and the unraveling sleeve of the worst girl vanish. Scale matters in a tragedy. The size of absence and smaller tragedies invisible. A war veteran in my class had been driving in a convoy when the guy in the back tapped him on the shoulder and said, look out. He was turning his head as a sh shell glided through his shoulder, but it took the center of the guy in the back. I loved his scarred head and the stories of his childhood and the careful voice in which he gave up and disappeared. That's what it means to be lost, your story muffled by the transit of bodies shuffled from the battlefields. On a husk of stained carpet in a rented room, in a warren of rented rooms, I was watching a baby stretch. I had traced this baby several times, the father in jail, the mother on the run, but I kept calling and now I could see he looked like his grandfather. Twenty years ago, his grandfather worked for me before he raped a client and went home to his wife reading the newspaper and shot her. His two daughters endure the state's care until one of them dies at 17. I can't tell you her story. I don't know if anyone was listening. But the daughter that runs and keeps on running, I want to tell her as though he is reaching out from prison to strangle her. Don't let him win. But a cliche won't release her from the terror blanketing her. I keep waiting for her, but she's not here today. Just the young daddy, newly on parole. Is this how you hold him? Is this, yes, how you hold him, her child born strung out and wandering himself? Help me, I say, the EMT and I pacing by the side of the road. The EMT is watching a woman speeding around a, bl a blind curve and the woman on a side road here somewhere being shot by her drug dealer and so on, always just behind me. The EMT is kind enough to share my haunting and hold my head. But will there be a memorial, a black wall, a reflecting pool? The EMT and I bring our tools and push through, push through the detritus of lives that never really began, then return to our good dinners and walks afterward across the park. The enjoyment possible from a shared meal and a walk the way love and hope are sustained by ritual and utterly beyond transmission. What I would really say to the mother of this baby waving at his shadow is I don't want my hands frozen in a cradle for the dead. I'm not sure where we are, but help me look for another exit. Maybe I would match her footfall for footfall, kicking at the substrate. Public tra tragedies offer some mutual island. When the challenger blew up, blew up and blew up on the wide TV of the group home I was working in. No resident had an IQ above 20. The lot of us voyagers covered in miles of space and scraps of burning cloth orbiting the planet. Adornment is the ear of culture, an echolocation of place, so that we don't forget where we belong. I hurry to keep in front of the ambulance or the convoy, not knowing what station I'm headed for. I imagine the sound of the sirens is always around me. Up the road from me, an apartment burned, containing a young acquaintance <clears throat> and her boyfriend. I mean, the ambulance went past my door and the smell of smoke drifted down. I had seen her a few days before, admired her second baby, and imagined the future contained her, but not me. The neighbors could hear them yelling for help, pounding on the walls. <clears throat> When will I stop hearing the ambulance go by my door? You're probably wondering about the trajectory of the orphans, of the burning parents and the grandparents, themselves the anarchy of loss, and then keening forward over the years. Not everyone reunites with the living. When my mother died, she wasn't more lost to me than she'd been before. Schizophrenic, she was unappeasable. I never said stay with me, though she has.
The title is, is partially from a line by Emily Dickinson, Started Early, Took My Dog. And the start, title of this is, It Did Start Early, My Head Bound in Aches. It did start early, my head bound in aches. Sometimes you're alive only to how bad you feel. Like you were the iron skillet banged on the stovetop, partly because of how heavy it is, partly to wake the sound of breakfast. Your grief cozies next to you like a garden. Sometimes you feel so thin, you're happy to have a roll of fat at your hips, tethered to the delight of this planet's ceaseless hunger, alike in our legs. Here is a moderately funny poem about my childhood, which really wasn't that funny. An absence mostly of aunts. I ate sugar daddies and sugar babies, Turkish taffy and Swedish fish, atomic fireballs, chocolate stars, and squirrel nut zippers, lifesavers and chuckles, peach blossoms and butterfingers glued in my pocket. My baby teeth abscessed. I ate food too, spam, potatoes. And I was sick, mumps, measles, bronchitis. My head bobbled in concussions from car accidents, my father a little drunk, and I had pneumonia, a kidney infection, I was allergic to mold, and dust made my lungs clap flat. In another age, I would have been dead by five and cute, my hair haloed. I wheezed through math, my skin flowered with chicken pox. I knew no order as my father moved us from town to town. I was waking urgently. I was suicidal, and even though I have worked to write this down, I find it unsurprising, a latecomer to the age of reason. This is about an, an extensive pet funeral and pet burial of late. Here joins the gray cat to the goldfish in eternal companionship, nudging the remains of five dogs. We honor the past best by not trying to relive it. No more gray cats or shallow graves. Wiping our hands with a ruckled skin on the backs of our hands. Wiping our eyes with a ruckled hand on the backs of our hands. We thank those whose sacrifices were neither brave nor meaningful by weeping freely over the inevitable. When the debris is swept off the stage at our passing, our history written by those who have none, and the small armory of our infection plundered, citizens, we will know liberty. <coughs> my parents had a, um, my parents were frequently married to each other, but they were also as frequently divorced. And in later years, um, when they were both fairly disabled, we would try to bring them together because they said they wanted to be with each other. She blind, he deaf, and propped in a wheelchair. After a few minutes of reunion, of eyes dampening, they seize a favorite quarrel, sharpening an old thorn. How well they remember their parts who seem to remember nothing and the fierce joy of their rage that they may drape themselves in the comfort of their former lives. I'll read one more and then I will stop. I have taught for an eternity at various places, mostly at community college. Sermon on composition. Oh, and my wife will bring up a funny poem for me to read right after this one. A sentence, Michelle, is an equation. It needs two balanced parts, tired sentences and fresh sentences both. It won't make you old to know this. You've learned harder things. If it is Emerson you have to blame for the, stake, for the state of modern poetry, then surely it is Thomas Aquinas you must blame for your essays. All human passion undulates in a form, like geese tethered in an arrow. You can keep your eye on the horizon. Whatever has fallen will rise up. Whatever has risen will have its low moment. Fame and grief follow the same fortune, even in the complex fortunes of a young woman. 
And for my closing poem, an utterly ridiculous poem, yes. called A Song in My Heart. See, I was supposed to print this. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're of a certain age, which I believe most of us are, this poem will have actually some meaning for you. God, thank you for bringing me blind faith when I can't find my way home, and an angel from Montgomery flying somewhere over the rainbow. In memory, turn my face to the moonlight and love me a little when I am knocking on heaven's door. A big yellow taxi brought me here after a Chelsea morning, and by the time I got to Woodstock, I knew these country roads would take me home. When will I be loved by the blue bayou? The weight fell off me in the Gulf of Mexico, although we built this city to a bohemian rhapsody out of, no out of Norwegian wood, it ain't mine no more. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, and thank you to all the poets. Let's hear it for them. That closes it for this evening. I invite you to partake of some refreshments in the back and buy some books. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry. That was early, actually. Yes, please, let's have a Q&A. All right, let's go to that. <laughs> All right, I have a question, my classic question. Poets, tell us who are your literary influences. <laughs> she said that before we started. <laughs> do you want to, can you shout or do you want to use the microphone? Or? We can shout, I think. We can shout. Yeah. Okay. Shout out names of poets, then. Ocean Wong. Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Love yes. Lucille Clifton. Oh, yes. yes. Eileen Miles. Oh. Anne Sexton. Yes. yes. Audre Lorde. Mm. Adrian Anna, Rich. Adrian, oh, yeah. Anna DeVere Smith, who's not a poet. She was a playwright. Poet in her own life. Other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm interested in. Um, when, when you started writing, when you started thinking of yourself as a poet? Pretty much always. The question is, when did you start thinking of yourself as a poet? Pretty much from the time I could write. Yeah. But definitely, that was what I want. By the time I had hit adolescence, I knew that was the only thing I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And it pays so well. I I started in my in my um, uh, adolescence. I was in a poetry class at school, and I fell in love with poetry. And um, so I thought, that's what I'm going to do. So, yeah, always a good to career write. choice. <laughs> Great career choice. You can do it no matter what you do for a living. <laughs> yeah, I've always written and wanted to write, but I remember rewriting the story of Christ coming to be a, a girl in a UFO who saved the world. And I'm going, yeah, I can write poems. <laughs> like I was 11. Yeah. Yeah, I think the same goes for me that, that um, it's always uh, been poetry. It hasn't always been in words, though. Uh, so it took me a while to uh, find uh, the craft of it. I, I just found myself writing really, really short things. And it's like, oh, that's a poem. <laughs> um, and, then, and then, you know, you, you learn craft around it. But um, there, there is so much poetry everywhere. It can be visual. It can be... Um, in movement, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kim, your your bio talks about a variety of creative expression. When there is an emotion or a thought, how does it land in which bucket, and does one influence the others? Oh, great question. 
Well, I, I, I like this, you know, the creative inspiration, that creative process. Yeah. Um, I don't really know how one thing or another will fall into different categories, except maybe when I know that there's a dialogue or a conversation I want to have, I really think of plays. But I have written poetic plays as well. So, and I also do visual art and I dance and I do choreography. So, you know, like when my knees hurt, I sit down and write. <laughs> <laughs> or I write things and then I go, oh, I would love to see this dance too. So it, it varies. Yeah, that's good. I'm gonna have to think on that. Have you ever written expresses? Expresses. 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 Thank you. I always <laughs> have had trouble with that. Expressing. It's because it's a dumb word. <laughs> it is. Unlike lenticular. Yes. <laughs> Which is a great word. Have any of you? Don't you find? Oh, sorry. Yep. Don't you find, Campbell, that there's some Speak real up. similar? There is some real similarity between poetry and theater. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and you know that because you've written plays with poetry. Though. Yeah, you know, and um, I think they're really connected in a lot of ways. Um, they are the way you communicate, and, you know. Remind me what ecstatic poetry is. <laughs> uh, uh, about a, a poem about a painting. Thank you. I'm like, I know that. No, it is a dumb word. No, <laughs> <laughs> some man made that. Up. It goes way back. The haiku um, used yeah. to be basically that. It, it was uh, not about the. It's nuanced. It's not about the painting. It's not like captioning the painting. It is um, a conversation. Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, the, yeah. the influence or the, yeah, yeah. it shouldn't have sounded so It's super interesting. Right, it is, it's very interesting, because I think there's a real tie between the two media. It's one of the first things we're taught to do in writing class. It's always, oh, to a Grecian you know, <laughs> like, oh, I write about right. this space. And, and so I think maybe most poets have done it to some extent yeah. without even knowing it. Right. Yeah. They might have an image in their head. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, poetry, and also what you were saying about poetry and playwriting, I mean, Shakespeare was uh, what got me interested in poetry. Yeah. He was a playwright and a poet. So that, you know, his poetry is meant, his stuff is meant to be read aloud. And that's, I am mostly, you know, more of a performance poet than anything. You know, when there's a lot of imagery, that's the most thing, you know, you can really write about that yeah. in the plays, too, yeah. because there's so much image. Um, I think that's the core of the connection. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Other questions or comments? All right, well, second time around, let me invite you to partake of the refreshments and uh, buy some books from the poets, and thank you for coming.